Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 373. Man, those numbers keep going up and it keeps blowing my mind that I get to keep coming back and talking to you a couple times a week and you all keep listening. Thank you for that continued support. You know, we do all of these episodes for free and you can go back and listen to all of them for free at any time. And we ask for just a little bit from you, whether that's sharing an episode, leaving us a review somewhere, or making a purchase at whistlekick.com. We really appreciate your help to keep this going. If you do make a purchase, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on anything over at whistlekick.com. The show notes for this and all the other episodes, including transcripts, are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So let's dig in. For this episode, we're going to talk about a comic book that was famous in the 80s and the 1990s. And who would have thought that a story about a group of turtles, you know, an animal that's supposed to be slow, would actually succeed as fast ninjas, martial artists, fighting bad guys. And their sensei, who taught them martial arts, is actually a rat. Now, for those who don't know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I'm going to tell you a whole bunch more. And for those of you that do, follow along, because we might get into some stuff that you didn't know about. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, also referred to as TMNT or just Ninja Turtles for short, consist of four fictional turtles in their teens who have human traits. They're named after great Italian Renaissance artists, including Leonardo for Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donatello. And they learn their martial art, ninjutsu, hence being Ninja Turtles, from their rat sensei, who, you know, is also anthropomorphized. Their mission, of course, is to defeat the bad guys, as in every great show and movie and comic book, but also remain hidden from society because, let's face it, they're kind of strange and people don't do well with strange and unusual. And so where are they usually hiding? They're in the sewers of New York City. Now, the comics were published by Mirage Studios, which was founded by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. And after becoming famous, the comic book expanded into not only an animated cartoon series on television, but also video games, toys, movies, and a ton of merchandise. And I'm going to guess that a good number of you out there, like me, had at least some Ninja Turtles stuff. If you're, you know, within a certain age range. I had action figures. I had a... Actually, I think my most interesting piece of Ninja Turtle memorabilia, and I think I have this, I'm going to try and take a photo of it, is a pencil case that I got while vacationing in Spain. And Ninja Turtles in Spanish is Tortugas Ninja. And I remember at age 12 watching Ninja Turtles in Spain in Spanish and just being absolutely transfixed. Mirage Studios published the first comic book from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series in 1984 in Dover, New Hampshire. And it started as a hilarious sketch from Eastman during a brainstorming session with Laird one evening, and that was how the concept for TMT, TMNT was born. They were convinced of the concept, and they self-published a single-issue comic despite having virtually no money. They took a loan from Eastman's uncle and used some tax refund money. The comic was inspired by popular comics from the 80s, including Marvel's Daredevil and New Mutants, Dave Sims' Cerebus, and Frank Miller's Ronin. It was liked by so many people, and it was published by various companies in different incarnations from then on. The next big thing, and arguably the big thing, that came for Eastman and Laird was a proposal from Mark Friedman, who was a licensing agent who wanted to make toys and other things using the Ninja Turtles. The first company that manufactured those toys was Dark Horse Miniatures in 1986, And the little lead figures were only 15 millimeters tall. Pretty tiny. The following year, Playmates Toys proposed to partner with the two and expand into action figures. And this led to a variety of companies and individuals collaborating in that project development. Jerry Sachs of Sachs Finley Agency assembled the animators at Murakami Wolf Swenson, led by Fred Wolf. And there's a name some of you might recognize. Then Wolf and his team of animators brainstormed with the Playmates group, headed by Carl Aronian. And Richard Salas, who was the sales vice president, and Bill Carlson, who was the Playmates vice president. And this led to some some different tasks, some distribution of work. Aronian gathered several designers as well as John C. Schultz 
to work on a simple backstory for the toy packaging for the entire run of the product and the show. Sachs invented the phrase, green against brick, for the high concept pitch. And the writers of Murakami Wolf Swenson conceptualized the sense of humor. The first show that was launched was a miniseries to sell in the toy action figures in which the Playmates toys and their team served as associate producers and contributing writers. The entire creative team was responsible for coining phrases such as heroes in a half shell and the Ninja Turtles battle cry, turtle power. More people came in as the series developed, including Jack Mendelson, who served as story editor and script writer, and David Wise, Michael Charles Hill, and Michael Reeves, who wrote most of the scripts. The first launch of the miniseries was honestly not successful, and it needed to be relaunched three separate times in order to catch on. Then Group W, the broadcast company, syndicated the show when they noticed that the product started selling. The next round of animation was funded by Group W and was shown on CBS. Since then, the show became a mainstream success in the late 80s and early 90s, and a wide array of Turtles merchandise was sold. Everything from video games and school supplies, hey, I mentioned that earlier, skateboards, Pez dispensers, breakfast cereal, bed sheets, towels, toy shaving kits, and just so much more stuff. The animated TV series, which continued until 1996 with 10 seasons, was characterized by a more cheerful mood as opposed to the gloomy atmosphere in the comic book series. And if you've ever read those comics, you know how much of a departure in, in spirit that the cartoons were. After this, another series was released, but a live action one, and new elements were added to the story, including the introduction of a fifth female turtle named Venus de Milo. However, unlike the first series, this one was highly unsuccessful, and it was canceled after just, was, after just one season of 26 episodes. The first live action film titled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was released in 1990 and became one of the most successful independent films. Two sequels were released under the titles Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze in 91, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 in 1993. The next film was a 3D animation that was released in 2007 under the title TMNT. Now, I don't know how many of you out there are like me and have seen all four of those movies, but I've definitely seen all four, and some of them much more than once. After some time, the original animated TV series got a reboot in 2003, but under the same name, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Storyline pretty closely followed that of the original Mirage comic book series, and the entire series had seven seasons, 156 episodes, and aired from February 2003 to March 2009 on Foxbox, also called 4Kids TV, and also on The CW for Kids for the last season. On October 21st, 2009, Laird made a statement on his blog, though the blog post does not exist anymore, about the selling of the TMNT property to Nickelodeon, a subsidiary of Viacom. Many fans were disappointed because TMNT was such a successful project, the most successful project for Mirage Studios, but Laird said that the property, quote, deserved a new owner, and that he had faith that the new owner would treat the property with respect and make the most of it. However, he also admitted that he did not know what the future of Mirage Studios would be after such a big decision. The first project to come out of Nickelodeon was a new CGI animated TMNT TV series premiering on September 29th, 2012. And as early as 2009, after purchasing the rights to TMNT, it was announced that a new film would be produced in partnership with Paramount Pictures. And the target release date would be 2012. It took until 2014, however, with Jonathan Liebesman as director and Michael Bay as producer. There's a name that gets polarizing in movies. All in all, there are at least 88 characters in the entire TMNT universe, while 10 of them are crossover characters, such as Batman. But we're only going to talk about a few of the main characters that you have seen or even heard of, if you know anything about the Ninja Turtles. Leonardo, also called Leo, the leader of the Turtles, he's the eldest, he's the most serious and the most dedicated follower of their sensei, Splinter. And he can be identified by his blue mask and his weapons, which are sometimes represented as katana, swords, or ninjatos. He's also the most disciplined among the brothers and often gets into conflicts with Raphael because of Raphael's aggressive attitude. Leo's named after, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo, also called Mike or Mikey, is the youngest of the brothers and is characterized by his carefree, goofy, humorous attitude. He's identified by his orange mask and by his use of two nunchaku. Uh, please don't call them nunchucks. That drives me crazy. And that's his 
most prominent weapon. He also uses sometimes a grappling hook, Manriki Gusari, uh, as well as Tunfa, Three Section Staff, a bunch of other stuff. The Southern California accent can also be picked up in some of the iterations, and he talks about surfing. Michelangelo is, of course, named after the Italian sculptor Michelangelo. Donatello, also called Don or Donnie, uh, no surprise here, was my favorite growing up. He's the nerd among the turtles. He has interest in science and technology and prefers to use his knowledge to resolve conflicts instead of pure physical combat. He's identified by his purple eye mask and his signature weapon, a bow, aka a staff, and is the third eldest of the brothers. Donatello is named after Italian sculptor Donatello. Raphael, also called Raph, the second eldest and identified by his red eye mask and his signature weapon, Psy. And he was my second favorite because as an early teen, I started really using and enjoying Psy as my weapon of choice. Raphael's attitude includes being easily angered and aggressive, and he often wants to make the first move in combat. He's the least friendly of the brothers and usually makes sarcastic remarks and offers deadpan humor. While he does have a rebellious attitude, he remains loyal to his brothers and to their sensei. And Raphael's named after the Italian painter, Raphael. Splinter is the turtle sensei, aka master, who taught them how to fight through his art of ninjutsu, which he learned from his previous owner, remember Splinter was a rat, and master, Hamato Yoshi. Aside from being a sensei, he also serves as the adoptive father of the four turtles. Now, Splinter's origins do differ depending on which body of work we're talking about. In the 87 TV series, the Archie comic series, and the 2012 TV series, Splinter was in fact Hamato Yoshi himself, who mutated into a rat through the, the ooze. In the 2003 series, he was Hamato Yoshi's pet rat and just mutated through the ooze, but had been observing what was going on from Yoshi. In the IDW comics, he was the reincarnation of Hamato Yoshi when Yoshi was slain by Saki, who later became Shredder. Now, I have plenty of other information here on other characters, April O'Neil, Casey Jones, Shredder, the Foot Soldiers, Karai, Baxter Stockman, Krang, Bebop, and Rocksteady. But if you want to check those out, I'm not going to dig into all of those individual descriptions. You can find those at the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Now, here's a big question. The writers, did they have a martial arts background? Let's start with Kevin Eastman. Eastman was born in Portland and studied at Westbrook High School in Westbrook, Maine. There, he met Steve Levine, who shared the same interests as him, and that is comic books. In 83, he already had several works, but he lacked a publisher. And while searching for one, he met Peter Laird and partnered with him on various comic book projects, including Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Peter Laird, on the other hand, was born in North Adams, Massachusetts, and we don't have a lot of his biography, but his interests, of course, including comics, and he had worked for a local newspaper earning just $10 per illustration. These two great comic book writers, artists, did not have any martial arts background. They didn't even expect that the Turtles would be a success in anything close to the time that it was. In fact, there are a lot of inaccuracies in the comics with regards to actual ninjutsu or just martial arts in general. Though the art itself is not as established and centralized as judo and karate, we can still pick up quite a few things if you sit down and read the comics. Maybe they had a hard time looking for good ninjutsu references, or maybe they were just taken by that wave of, of ninjutsu ninja fascination that existed back then. And for some reason, Eastman and Lair just really wanted the turtles to be ninjas rather than karate or taekwondo practitioners, and they equipped them with Asian weapons. Anyway, the comics sold like crazy because people loved the concept, the story, and of course, the turtles. When we talk about the Ninja Turtles, we can't ignore the impact that they've had on popular culture, on the martial arts, and as such a pivotal work in popular culture that fed martial arts schools with a wide number of new students. In fact, if we were to make a list of the movies that led people into martial arts schools for all time, you know, we're probably talking about, I'm not ordering these in any particular way. It's Enter the Dragon, it's the Karate Kid, the original, and it's the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I mean, these three movies inspired so much interest in martial arts that even if you don't know the Ninja Turtles 
well. I'm sure you're aware of them, even if it's not something that you've ever enjoyed. If you're a martial artist, you owe it to the martial arts to at least check out a little bit of it, because we all owe so much to these two gentlemen, Eastman and Laird, and their creation. Don't forget, you can find the transcript at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can help us out by checking out whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code PODCAST15. And if there's nothing over at whistlekick.com that works for you, that's fine. Just go ahead, share this or another episode. Help us grow. Help us out. We do this show for free. We want to continue to do it for free. We don't want it to get bogged down with outside sponsorships or anything. We're trying to keep it tight. So thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. You can follow us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.